Hi there, I'm Dave Butler. I'm Grace Freeman. Welcome to Don't Miss This. That was so funny because in my mind, I'm so used to hearing your mom say, it was a trick. Emily, like, yeah, I was like, whoa. Like got your the, name. the rhythm of that was, um, I was like, oh. <laughs> but this is Don't Miss This. It's our scripture study podcast, YouTube video. Don't know if you're watching or listening, but hi, wherever you are. And uh, we go through this year, the New Testament. Um, we're in the letters of Paul right now. And um, you, I had a good friend just text me yesterday. He was like, will you tell me what you love about Paul? And I was like, I just had so many things, but it was cool. It's a five-page essay. Yeah, to think to myself, like, oh, what do I love so much about, so much about Paul? And man, this is just, to be in these letters where you talked about a couple of times ago that he's reconnecting with these people that he's just grown to love and you just have to keep remembering that he is speaking to people that he introduced the gospel to and that he's trying to keep them in the faith. And I think everybody who's watching this or listening to this probably has somebody that you are in that you worry about and that you want to encourage or that you want to keep in the faith. And if you can have those pictures of people in your mind as you read these, I think they really come they come alive and you just want to love it more because then you're like oh why did he love them yeah. because you have all these reasons of why you love your person that it's like oh this is so real so raw right you right. know which is cute so they are to actual people who were you know had actual like stories and problems and and family drama and and work issues and it's just every time we read scripture we want to fill in those blanks that aren't necessarily there and it helps it to come alive. I've always thought that imagination is one of the best scripture study skills. Like use your imagination to fill in the storyline and the faces and everything that's happening. And wonder about things. Yeah, right. You know? Yeah. Like when it says a name, wonder who it is. Why did he love them? Why did he want to talk to them? And why mention them? Like what? Yeah. Yeah. And some of it you can look up. This is where like a study Bible is really helpful sometimes. And you can order them on Amazon and any of them will do. But like an uh, uh, ESV study Bible, NIV study Bible, Bible, (laughs) King James Version study Bible. And there's footnotes that aren't just references to other scriptures, but will give you background information. And there's a lot out there that you can discover. So if you're curious about something as you study and you have the time and energy to want to do it, there's, there's a lot of resources for that. Okay, today we're calling together with God because this line that Paul uses in here and and just this idea all throughout today's lesson of Paul almost reminding people of the beauty of doing life together with God. Not like, and the work, his work, that it's something that he could have done by himself, but he invites us into it. And there's something really cool about that. And I think you'll see that throughout the chapters that we look at today. Okay, this is, we have a tip in for every new book that we start. And this one is, um, these. this is for 1st and 2nd Corinthians. So you can just slide it right in front of 1st Corinthians and glue it in there. And if you missed the one about the Romans, these tip ins, they say who the author is, about when this letter was written, and kind of the audience and a little bit of the background of what's happening in the city that he's writing to right here. And then there's like a little table of contents a quick find of like, oh, the really cool, like super rad stuff that's in and and like the, uh, I don't know, the meaty stuff that's in these chapters that you probably want to remember and then a blank back so that you can keep creating your own table of contents there. So this is the tip in that's for uh, Corinth. And we'll just show you this in a little bit of kind of what is, um, what's on it. Um, here's a map of where Corinth is. So you'd have to zoom out if you want to see it a little bit, but there's Athens, which is super easy to find on a map. And it's just right kind of across this little like bay right here is where Corinth is. And because it is right here on, what do they call this on maps? Like where it's like a, it's like an isthmus, (laughs) you know, (laughs) like that came to me from like 10th grade geography where like there's a strip of land and the ocean on either side, (laughs) smart people, like it's okay. You don't have to email. I'll look it up right after you don't have to like message me. I'll like look it up, everybody. Um, even though I was trying to think of a word last week, and I kept like, "What is that word? What is that word?" And like your mom 
texted me yesterday the word and I knew exactly <laughs> what she was doing. And I was like, you're listening to the podcast right now, aren't you? And she was like, yes, and this is the word you she were, read your mind. Yeah, that you like, were looking okay, for. So true. But what's important to see this map is one, to inspire you to want to go to this place someday because right. why do you not want to go? I, listen, I want to lead a tour through this area, the okay, Teachings of to? Paul tour, and I'm going to go to really all pretty. these yeah. islands, okay? Oh, wow. um, so it's right here and there's ocean on either side. So this is super important because it's a port city, which means you're bringing in not only product, but you're bringing in ideas from all over and you're bringing in travelers. And so this is going to be a wealthier city and it's going to be like a city that's on the map. Like it's got important, like a strategic location. And so that's going to affect the culture of this place. They're not just going to be some country bumpkins there. They're going to be advanced and they're going to, what's next? You know, they're in trade, they're in business. They're like, they're always looking for the next best thing. And so you see that a little bit in the personality of the letter that Paul writes to him. This is all that's left today, but even now it's still it's cute. cute and pretty. You want to go right at the, look, they go hiking in the morning in these mountains. So it's just a city that's like that. And when he starts off, I think this is something you just love about Paul when you read his stuff. If I went through yesterday and you know how you are in a conversation with someone and they will keep bringing something up over and you can kind of tell what someone's thinking about these days or like what's on their mind, or if like it's somebody who's kind of got someone that they're interested in right now, they got a little crush and they keep bringing them up, you know, Paul has that <laughs> kind of crush on Jesus is the truth here, the you know, way because, of saying that ever. I mean, look at it in first Corinthians one, I went and I highlighted what verses one through 10, every time he mentions Jesus in here. And I think there is something significant about that, that he begins this letter and he's going to address some of the issues and some of the things that need correction and encouragement and, you know, court, you know, change in Corinth. Um, but he starts off like he does most letters with this, like you let us remember we are the apprentices of Jesus. He is, he is the head of our church. He is the foundation of our faith. Let's keep things centered on him. Let's remember that everything else that happens after chapter one and everything we talk about is in, let's connect it to relationship with Jesus. If I correct you, it has to do with strengthening or repairing a relationship and connection to Jesus. Let's not forget that he is the center of our faith. Let's not get sidetracked by principles or ideas or something without connecting them to him. And he didn't even want to just imply it. Like he actually spelt it out. I think sometimes in our heads we're like, that's implied. People right. know that that's the foundation. I don't need to go through and say it. But he's like, oh no, actually I am. I'm going to go through and say it 15 times in yeah. 10 verses. Right. So that you know, you have something actual real to go back on. And let's not just tie it to him somehow in the end, like figure yeah. out a way to fit him in. Yeah. But like, let's make it the start in the center of everything I'm going to teach has to do with, and as teachers, you know, and parents, as friends, as, as speakers, whatever we are, um, as you know, in our faith communities or families, I think it's really, really important that we follow this. There is power when we can connect it to the Lord. Like that is where the power of our principles that we teach are. Commandments have more power if we can connect them to, okay, to our relationship with him, um, to, or, you know, or to others as we love God and love people. I think there's something about that that we can learn from Paul as he starts off each of these letters. And he, and he goes in chapter one and you'll see he starts to bring up, starting in verse 13, division is one of the problems that is happening in the Corinth church. And we'll talk about that more in next time's um, lesson. But he starts to mention some of the problems that are in there. One of the other things that he mentions if you, as you go into chapter two, which I think is really cool, is this idea of in Corinth, it's a city that's known for philosophers and everybody's coming up with the next idea and they're analyzing and they're just like, man, they, it's just like what Instagram is today. All these different ideas and thoughts and everybody's really smart and they're bringing up like, different ways to, you know, do life and 
understand things. And Paul starts in chapter two and they're used to that too. They're used to people like with really being really eloquent and excellent in speech, he says. And at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 2, he says, and I, brethren, when I came unto you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, but declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And he was like, my message was simple. It was about a king of kings who came down to this earth to rescue his family. And he rescued them through a humiliating death on a cross. And he says, and I know that sounds really foolish to you. And it sounds really simple. Or a line I used to get a lot as a bishop, that's too good to be true. And and sometimes we look at the simplicity of that message. and, and, And we may think to ourselves like, could it be that simple? Could it be that easy? But I love what Paul says here in verse four. And he says, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. And he emphasizes here in this chapter, he says, but the way that you know that it's meaningful and worth listening to and worth engaging in is the power that comes into your life when you, when you do listen and engage with the Lord. And, and like Paul, I think we could both say, I, I, I almost want to ask people like, how do I know if a certain lifestyle is a good lifestyle or a message is, is good and true and worthwhile? And I would say, what are the fruits of it? What is coming from like following that sort of belief or, or, you know, just diving into that sort of like practice? Like what, what do you notice is, is happening? And Paul says, there is power when I speak of Jesus. There's power when I follow his words. There's power when I am in relationship with him. Like things just change and things are different when he's a part of the, of the, of the story. And he's like, and, and that's what I have as the proof. Like I don't have necessarily like eloquent arguments, although Paul could hang with them with <laughs> eloquent arguments for sure. But he's just like, but I want you to notice the power that comes. Hidden wisdom is what he says in verse seven. You actually probably won't be able to explain how it's happening. It will seem almost like magic to you where you will just say, listen, I, I don't know what, what else to say. I remember, um, you may know this story. Remember this from Easter time that my little Caleb, when we went on this hike at Easter time to this cross up in Spanish Fork um, for part of Holy Week, and we got up there and Caleb saw the cross and he said to me, hey, dad, you know that green hill far away? Because we'd sung that song <laughs> so much during our home church, <laughs> like during COVID. And he just said, it's here. Um, I found it and ran off. And it was just like, it just made me think about how that act is so strange in, in you know, in the, and especially for them, he was like, what crucifixion's humiliating? Why would you even bring that? Right. So like, but that one act like happened 2000 years ago and 2000 miles away, but I still feel the power of it. Like I see people differently because of what happened there. My whole life and perspective is different because of the story of Jesus and, I, and it's hidden wisdom as far as I'm concerned. I don't know why I feel the way I do. I don't know why it lifts me up and encourages me the way that it does, but it just does. And, and Paul gives us this promise where he says, it's written, verse 9, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him, which is so rad because he's saying like, hey, you know those little hints that you've gotten? Those are only the beginning. In life with Jesus of Nazareth, you can expect and anticipate surprises around the corner, wonder, um, exciting new changes and and ways of seeing the world and people that you haven't even you haven't even scratched the surface yet and it's so rad to think of him saying like oh you you think this is good it's like we're just getting started with this and that is the best way to start ever because it's almost like he's like everything i tell you from here on out i need you to learn but i need you to learn it remembering the god we believe in Mm. you know yeah this is all going to be important but what's going to be more important 
is that you remember God when I tell you all the rest of these things, mm. you know? Yeah. And what starts happening is all of a sudden he's going to start talking about a little farm. It's a fake <laughs> farm, but <laughs> it's a farm. And I don't know. I will say this about myself. I'm not a farmer. I'm not a gardener. My mom and dad will also tell you that I'm not a farmer or a gardener because think about it. You know, because you're the dad, so you know how this affects kids, is that when a parent says that you have to do the garden, that's the worst Saturday of the year. That I, is terrible. I know. And then you grow up and all of a sudden you start to like it. And that's how you know you have crossed a threshold. You're old now. <laughs> yeah. That's I was it. like, oh my gosh, I'm actually really interested in <laughs> growing things. Like, I legit want to move to a farm so bad. Like I Your just, 14 year old self would hate you for saying that. I know, but I just, I, then I would say, I would visit 14 year old and be like, listen, little boy, someday, <laughs> someday, you'll you're actually gonna love like it. You're weeding. You'll love weeding because you're like, I'm taking care of something. <laughs> you like, no. it, really, it happens. I'm just going to tell you, it just happens. I don't do it yet, right? <laughs> But I can see like already the trickling the idea of like, Being oh, you know, gardener. just have a little horse out there. And I don't know how to like clean out its horseshoe or anything <laughs> like that. But, you know, like okay. the oh, idea. Yeah. It's the idea. Anyways, just letting you know it's that's coming. It's coming when I get old. But it makes me think I will do the garden for my mom and dad because I love them and because I lived with them. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I'm like, OK, that is worth my time. Part of it was my duty as a child that I had to. <laughs> but also, like, if a stranger on the street was like, hey, I'm weeding, could you come help me out? The Christian in me would say yes, but the real me would say no. <laughs> like, I'm like, I'm not weeding. I'm not going to weed for anybody. I, that is the worst job in the world. And I love that he's going to start talking about a garden. But before he ever talked about the garden, he's like, I need you to remember who you're working for. Mm -hmm. You know? Like, and don't forget. And I'll, and I'll say who you're working with, you yeah. know, because we see that in, you know, in his language. And it's like, yeah, it's because it, it's not just going to be a boss. Saying yeah, like, but I would, I would work for you. a good boss. Like, I'm okay to like work for somebody. Yeah, you but know? it's so much better. When he's with, you yeah. know? Yeah. So what happens is he starts talking about his farm. Okay. Like, this is in chapter three and it starts in verse six. And he says, okay, I have planted. I did it. I planted. And if you start thinking the way he's talking, he's like, I started the seed. I gave you these ideas. I started these beliefs. Like, I got you going. I planted it. And that is a lot of work. If you're a gardener, you know that. He's like, I did it. I planted. And then he introduces you to this guy named Apollos. And he says, Apollos watered. He did work after me. I came in. I got you guys going. I got the ideas started. I started your beliefs. You were going and you were okay. And then Apollos said, now it's my turn. Let me help you. Yeah. Let me get you going. Let me put all the water. Let me start this process. And then there is the cutest line ever. A good reminder when all of a sudden it's going to say, but God gave the increase. We worked. We put in work. We tried our very best. We put in hours and hours and hours. But don't you forget that it's God that made the increase. And he that planteth and he that watereth are one. This is verse eight. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his labor. Like your work is not going to be forgotten. But don't you forget that it's God that did the increase. And if I was teaching this, I think it's really fun to start playing into the idea of a garden. And it's such an easy thing to catch on to. And even if you have little kids, I think it'd be so just go get like little seeds yeah. and a little plant and a little Dixie cup and have them all plant something. Because I think it's something worth noting that you can do everything you possibly can to get that seed to grow. You can give it soil. You can give it water. You can put it outside. You can put it in a perfect little Dixie cup and set it outside and you can, you can have it all ready. You can plant. You can water. You can do it all. But there's going to come a moment that day when you plant that all of a sudden you're going to say, now what? Yeah. yeah. What, are you, what is going to happen now? And what's going to happen now is you're going to wait. Mm. Because you're not in charge of the increase. And sometimes in our real life, the waiting is actually the hardest part. We think it's the work that's hard. But the waiting, I think, might be a little bit harder. And it makes me want to stop and just think for a second about my actual life and think, okay, if I'm going to make this mean something to me, I better start, like, wondering about things. And then I think it makes me think, okay, who is going to plant? 
right? All of a sudden, Paul, he was the first planter. But in my life, who planted me? Who got me started on my belief? Who like planted this idea of a God who loves me as big as he loves me? Yeah, and let me just, before you keep going, in the journal, when you have those questions where it just says who plants, who waters, and who gives the increase, you you could and maybe want to write in there, okay, the scripturally, like for the people of Corinth, but then I love what you're doing right here, which is the space here, like also write who planted something in me. Like that would be so cool to like go back and, and think about that. And it's such a cool imagery of like, okay, who got you started? How did they get you started? Why do you love them for that? But then... Who watered you? Who kept you going? Yeah. In a hard time when you didn't think that you wanted to keep growing or when you didn't want to keep like investing in this faith, who actually watered you along the way? Yeah. You know, who kept that idea going and who helped you when you thought, I think I'm done with this? Who stepped in then? Um, but then it leads you back to the same place of waiting. And I think lots of us find us in like ourselves in a waiting place usually because that's what takes the longest in a garden, is waiting. And it makes me think of this, um, it makes me think of this boy that I met a year ago. And the first time that I met him, we were gonna be on a trip for two and a half weeks together. And I was his trip leader, we were in Costa Rica. And the first day that I met him, he like got off the bus. And I don't think I've ever seen a crankier boy in my entire life. (laughs) And in my head, I was like, you are in Costa Rica. I was like, why are you cranky? You're not coming to weed. Yeah, you're fine. And I almost said that. Like, I was like, he like got out and he was like the most like one word answers. I was like, are you excited? He's like, "Mm." and I was like, oh, poor you zip lining through a jungle. (laughs) Sorry, we're learning to surf tomorrow. I'm like, you have the hardest life ever. In my head, I was saying that. I was trying to act nice, but I was like from the beginning, like, you're kidding me. Like, I was like, just be happy that you're here. Like, that is like what Costa Rica is about. And right after our first conversation, I walked away and I literally just went through my head. I was like, this is going to be a long two and a half weeks with that boy. <laughs> I was like, oh no. Because if you're not happy on the first day, you're going to hate day 10. And so I was like, here we go. And the longer we like went through that first weekend, you could see he was kind of getting one over because we were doing really cool things. But still, like, not sold. And we had, like, time every single day to, like, read our scriptures. And I would, like, look over at him every day during scripture time. And I'm not kidding you. I think he probably drew more stick figures in that time than I've ever seen any, like, amount of stick figures drawn ever. Like, just couldn't have cared less. And finally, it was Sunday. And we had scripture time, and we were at a park. And he, like, started picking up rocks and was just, like, throwing them. And he'd throw them against the fence, and it would, like, cling. And then he'd start throwing them near kids, and they would, like, look over, and they'd all laugh. And finally, the person I was with was like, hey, we got to do something about the rocks. Like, we can't. We're trying to have, like, a spiritual moment. Like, we got to take care of the rocks. And I was like, okay, I'll do it. I was, like, trying to be really brave. So I was like, I'll go. I'll go over and talk to him. And so I stood up, and I went, and I sat next to him. And finally, right when I sat down, I was just kind of like, the problem's not the rock throwing. I was like obviously something else is going on that he doesn't Mm -hmm. want to like invest in this relationship with God. So I was like, listen, be a hundred percent honest. Where are you at? Like, I'm not your mom. I'm not your bishop. I like, I just barely met you three days ago. Like you could really be honest with me. Where are you at? And he sat there for a second, like thinking. And then all of a sudden, you know, when you can see someone get angry, like in their eyes and Mm -hmm. like their like hands kind of like start like clenching instead of like being and like, their face gets a little more red. I could see that he was starting to get angry. And I was like, okay. I was like, what? What's happening? And he said, you know what? I've tried. I've tried. And he's like, no, actually, I have tried so hard. I turned off my explicit music for an entire week. I would do those stupid prayers where you would get down on your knees and you would pray and then you would wait until an answer and you would just sit there and you wouldn't get off your knees until you found an answer. And I would try every single day. I'd wake up earlier to read my scriptures. I'd flip to an open page. I would try to find answers. I did all the things that people had told me about. And then he stopped and he looked at me and he was so mad. And he said, and God still doesn't want to talk to me. Mm. So why would I care about him if he won't even talk to me? And if I was being a really good trip leader, I would have like had a really good answer for him. <laughs> and instead, this is really true. I legit looked him in the eyes and I said, Okay, I don't really care what you do during personal study. Just don't throw any more rocks. 
<laughs> that's true. Why did I do that? And then I legit just stood up, walked away. That was it. The end of the conversation, which was not a win. But um, we like went through the rest of the week. And the longer the week went on, me and him started to become like best friends. Mm. And like I loved to talk to him. And we only would talk about like lacrosse, football, and like his life at home, and then what was happening on the trip. But we loved each other. Like he was my little brother. Mm. I loved him. And a week later, exactly a week later, we were on a bus and I was sitting in the front and I just like looked back on all the kids and I started just like looking at them each individually. And as I was looking, just someone from the scriptures just would pop into my head for each kid. And after like the third, I like started writing them down. And um, I just had that list and I went to bed and it was Saturday night and I woke up on the next Sunday and I was like, oh, I should have them read those people because maybe something in their story would help cool. them. Super cool. So I just like wrote it down really quick and I passed out all the notes. And for him, the name that came so fast was Hezekiah. And I didn't even know the story of Hezekiah, <laughs> but I just kept thinking that was the name I should write down. So I like wrote it down and I didn't know it. Like I had no idea about it so much so that when I like wrote it down, I like looked up on Google. I was like, where is the story of Hezekiah? And then I like wrote it in parentheses <laughs> so he could find it. And I passed it all out and um, he came up to me and he like threw his scriptures at me and he's like, I have no idea what that story's talking about. And in my head, I was like, Say. <laughs> I don't know why. I was like, oh, I'll help you. I was yeah. like, let me come sit by you. And we like talked it through. And the more we talked it through, I was like, oh, this was like, I could see that the spirit had a really good idea. So I like walked it through with him. And as I was going, I was like, oh, this is going to be it. Like he's going to fill it. And we like stopped. We like finished the story and he just closed the scriptures and handed them back to me. And he's like, okay, thank you. And I was like, okay, guess that wasn't it. It's mm. fine. And then that night, um, we were, everyone was getting ready for bed and um, I was in the kitchen and he came down to get a little snack before he went to bed. And he's like, hey, um, Grace, can I talk to you? And I was like, yeah, of course. What's up? And he looked at me and he just said, I have been waiting for three years to feel God's love for me. And today, sitting on the stairs, reading that story is the first time I felt known and loved by God. Mm. And it was all of a sudden this moment that I was like, wait, someone had been planting and someone had been watering, but that boy had been waiting for a long time. Yeah. There was a long time in that wait. But it makes me want to think about that verse that he wanted to start with, that Paul wanted to start with, that just wants to say, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Mm. And that boy's answer could have come a hundred different ways. He could have felt God's love six months before that or three months before that in a completely different way. But that boy loved to fill it in Costa Rica. Mm. He needed it. Yeah. That was better than he could have ever dreamt up was that moment in Costa Rica. And it just makes me think that the waiting is hard, but the God that we're working with makes it worth it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and I think as somebody who, I mean, I, you can take this both perspectives. One is to think and consider through somebody has planted and somebody has watered me and God's going to provide the increase in my own way and time. And it would be good for me to be patient. But it's also good as the planter and as the waterer of others mm. to remember that, number one, something is happening under the ground that you might not see. Like, you, like it hasn't popped up out of the dirt quite yet. And so to be okay with that, number one. And number two, to also be okay as the waterer and the planter to wait and, and let God do his work in there and to listen. Like I really think it was so valuable this that you followed the instruction of the spirit there and saying like i think i'm supposed to just give everybody these you know things and not to be the hero but just be like i will water lord when you want me to water you know because sometimes i also think don't overwater <laughs> okay, yeah. we don't want to flood <laughs> the people you know and don't underwater mm -hmm. you know and how would i know but to listen and but also to be patient as someone who loves a child or someone who loves a friend to say and trust that God is going to do his work of increase in them. I cannot force the growth, but I can create the conditions and I can speak the words or try and provide the experiences, you know, again, under the direction of, of heaven, but 
I, I I just think that's such a powerful and important principle in there when you look at this. This is such an awesome awesome principle. Verse nine it says, "For we are laborers together with God," which is so awesome to even think about, right? Um, and to and to feel like a sense of because he says you are God's husbandry or farm, right? That you you're also like you're also a plant and the farmer. You play both <laughs> roles, you know, sometimes yeah. in there. And God does that magic work, however plants work. I, don't even try and DM me and tell me it's photosynthesis. That is a scientific word for magic. Okay, that is. Uh-huh. Like, like you don't don't even try and tell me about mitochondria cells or whatever. Like I. <laughs> There is like no way of knowing like what's actually happening. Why are you using the, so much high school vocabulary in your education today? <laughs> School's about to start. So I'm just like in the mode or something, right? But you know what I mean? Like you yeah. look at a plant and you're like, I actually don't know how that happened. And you actually have to like have a trust and faith in God that he's doing his work in his own timing. And Paul planted it, but maybe he never saw the increase. And Apollos watered it and maybe he never saw the increase. And that might be our story. Sometimes. And the, it's okay to wait. And it's especially okay to wait when you remember that the God you're waiting for is one that's going to make it better than anything you could have ever imagined. Amen. Danny wants to say, okay, if you're not a farmer, maybe you're <laughs> a, a construction worker. <laughs> you know? <Stoffel>. Yeah. Because <laughs> he's like, we're, you're also in verse 9, you're also God's building. And he says, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder... I got a chance to lay the foundation for your life, right? And the foundation I laid is the foundation of Jesus Christ. P.S. Master builder, is that the word that's used in the Lego movie? Yes. <laughs> you're your master you're builder. Right. I, think you're right. I don't think I've ever. You guys, a great Sunday movie for 1 Corinthians 3 is going to be the Lego, the Lego movie. movie. I promise I could come up with some principles from that. But he just said, okay, now if we take this building example, um, he says, I am a master builder and the foundation that I laid in verse 11 is the foundation of Jesus Christ. And we are building our foundation off of him. It's like sort of that Helaman 512 would be a great um, cross-reference scripture here about building on the foundation or the wise man building on the rock at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Those would be great. Like, oh, the same sort of idea that he's talking about. And we have this idea of Jesus, his name as a foundation and something put down a footing, a supporting structure, a founding principle of this idea of you can build your life on and in relationship with him and on the principles that he taught. Mm. And I think there's something um, about that with this name where he's just like, let him be your foundation. There are so many things that we think, is this going to work or how long is this going to last? And we have a promise here that this is a firm foundation. It is Jesus Christ. Like you can trust him and he will not fail you. Like we, like that has been tried and true. That is tried and true. Like it just in, in so many people's lives. And maybe it's one of the reasons we gather in faith community as a reminder is like, you can trust him. You can build your life on these principles. Like they will not fail you. And time has showed us that. Like for 2,000 years, people have been doing that. And it is that is, it still stands true today. Like go to Corinth and there's only one pillar there left. You know, they have all fallen. There are just some building practices that last better than others. And a life built on him is one of those. And so this is that word for that foundation. But he just says this. He gives this introduction. And this is the worksheet for this week, which is cool because... You can hand out copies of this and it's interactive if you're teaching a class or with your family during um, when you do home, come follow me. And there's a couple questions in here as a person thinks about, okay, this foundation or this life, I'm going to build on Jesus Christ. What does that actually look like? So you have the first question up here, which is, okay, circle the materials that you would use to build your house, right? And you got a little three little pigs vibe here. (laughs) This comes from verse 12 and he says now if any man build upon this foundation with gold silver precious stones wood hay and stubble those would be some of the things that you could pick to build this and then there's a chance to to choose here which one of these things would you build you know use to build your house but then he says in verse 13 and maybe you would read this next if everybody choose first what do you want to build your house 
out of. And, and they could pick other things too. Like it might be fun to have them write down and say like, oh, I also want to use bamboo or I want to use <laughs> like whatever, you know, that they want to use in there. Now 13 says, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it. Um, just talking about there is a day when like you're going to see whether it stands because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. The fire is going to reveal what kind, um, how strong and how good of a material that is. So this is a great question to then ask. Like, what is the test going to be? He says it's going to be fire, but obviously that's symbolic. So what is, how is that structure going to be tested? Or you might say earthquake, and it's just like, okay, still symbolic. So what is it that it might actually be? And something might be a trial, and you could have a brainstorming session here to say like, okay, what kind of trials? It's like, okay, what about a job loss? What about a death in the family? Some of those things that might have shaken or might feel like heat, you know, that's come. One that you might consider talking about altogether or thinking to yourself is time. And not only like the end time, but also like just a length of time. <laughs> Look five years down the road, 10 years down the road. It is something like that going to last? Is it going to keep providing, you know, fulfillment? And maybe that's another test, you know, it's like that test of what are the fruits or what are, what's, what's the fulfillment level of this, mm. you know? Um, and then question, which part of the house is going to actually withstand that test? Because he just said, if any man's work abide, verse 14, which he hath built upon, he shall receive the reward. And the reward is like, it's still standing there. And if any man's work shall be burned, he will suffer that, the loss of that. Um, make sure I come back to 15 in just a second because okay. it ends like so rad. But with this, wor with this worksheet that you have, it's like which part of the house is going to withstand the test? And I like Paul's question there. He's like, which one of them do you think is going to abide? So I put right here, things of eternity, maybe is that test thing. Like what I'm adding into my life, um, is that going to withstand the test of time? Like, will they still be with me in 20 years from now? Will I care about it in 50? What about in 200 years from now? Like, is it still going to be something that I'm going to, that's going to continue to last, right? So there's like several ways of, of doing life. One, a, one you could do like, okay, what if I follow the principle of honesty? For 10 years? What would my life look like in 10 years? But what if I lived a life of deceit? What would that look like in 10 years? So building upon Jesus as our foundation, one of the ways that we do that is building upon his teachings, right? How would I know whether something is going to last or not? And it's a good chance to kind of play, almost like imagine out what that's going to look like. And so then the very last question is, what are your gold silver, and precious stones. Those are things that are going to last. And time and trial are actually, they make silver and gold and precious stones even better, right? So it's not only that they'll last, but they get better with time too. And some of the things that I wrote down for myself would be like relationships with God and with others. Like if I fill my life, if I fill my time, like building relationship, like those are going to last and they get better with time experiences and lessons learned, like they are going to last. I'm going to keep them. And I'm going to look back and they're going to get better with time. Like what are, what are the things I'm going to add into this building of my life that are actually going to, where am I, what are my priorities? And will they stand when trial comes or as, as time moves on? So it's a cool way to just kind of be an architect of your life to kind of like, okay, how am I going? And Paul's advice is, listen, you can build it however you want. My advice is I laid a foundation of Jesus Christ. And in my experience, that's the one that's lasted. I've been to prison and, and I'm okay. I, I've been persecuted and, and I'm okay. I've seen disappointment and, and, and it hurt. it's fire, but I'm okay. And it's because I've strengthened that relationship with, you know, with him and I've built my life on the principles he taught me. Well, and I love that when you think about the things he wants to describe as some of the best you could use, gold, silver, and precious stones, is that you cannot build an entire house with one stone. 
it's not going to work, mm. you know? And I think that could be such a cool conversation in families of like, okay, it's not just going to be one thing. Yeah. You can't just have one moment from your life that you're like, oh no, like that's it. Mm -hmm. It's really going to have to be a lot. Yeah. You know, you're going to have to keep growing. And I think it would be such a cool question to even just say, I want you to write down one of your stones. Like awesome. what is actually one of your stones and then talk about that. Yeah. And you could put it right here. Like what? Yeah. not only yeah. like in concept and idea, like, oh, you know, relationship with God, experience with God. It's like, okay, yeah. In general, that's awesome. Now write down. What are yours? what is one of your experiences with God that you actually like feel like you are? Because when you talk about building a house here, it's like something that you feel safe in and something mm. that you feel protected in, you know? And so it's almost worth asking that question. Like, tell me about the things that like you feel like secure in and you feel safe in and you have felt like the comfort of home almost, right? Yeah. I just like that he's building that. And and he then ends by saying like, you He's like, listen, when I'm talking about gold, silver, and precious stones, I'm not just talking about a house. I'm talking about that temple mm. that you're welcomed into also, you know? So it's, it's a really cool concept there. Are you going back to 15 or no? Um, oh, yeah. I, I'm so glad. Yeah, see? I, That's yeah. why I'm here. I'm on it. I think it's so awesome that he says this. If any man's work shall be burned, and he, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. And I think it's, a really powerful principle there to teach and at least to remember about ourselves and others. If I have built my life out of hay, wood, and stubble, those things that felt like they were going to work or they were a quick fix or whatever they were, and the test or the time passes and they don't last, what he's saying is, um, yeah, you're going to suffer loss because of that. That is true. But not your soul. Your soul can still be saved. Start over. The foundation is still there. And if it's mm. a foundation of Jesus Christ, that means because of who he is, you can build again and build again and build again and build again. And he says, you actually will be saved, yet so is by fire. Because sometimes when trials burn those things out of our lives, we realize, oh, I guess it wasn't something. So like the trial, the fire actually ended up saving me in the end because I realized, oh, I didn't I didn't I don't think I knew that those things didn't matter as much as I thought that they mattered. Mm. And I just think there's a lot of hope in that verse 15. It's really cool. So you could start over. Yeah. It's okay. Mm. Um then he's going to keep going and I think this starts to mean so much more once you realize the context in which he's speaking to this group of people that is so used to hearing really good public speakers and really cool ideas and really like fascinating principles that all of a sudden all these group of people really care about how people talk right they're hearing good people they're hearing good words like all of a sudden they're getting attached to that right yeah like oh yeah. good stories good ideas good thoughts that all of a sudden he's going to break it down and if you go into verse in cha to chapter four and then you start in verse 20 all of a sudden he's going to say this listen the kingdom of God is not word. It is not what you're going through and just talking about. And it's not all these people sharing really good stories. That's not what the kingdom of God is about. Right. And then all of a sudden he's like, listen, the kingdom of God is not in word, but it's actually in power. And um, I think that starts to mean something different when you remember how Jesus built the kingdom of God, because he did it through priesthood power in love. Mm. He walked every single day. Like that was his motivation. He said, I'm not going to build this up by just telling you how you're supposed to live. I'm actually going to show you. Mm. I'm going to show you what it looks like to live in God's power. And that's going to look like miracles. That's going to look like healing. That is going to look like an abundance of care. Like this is what it actually looks like to build the kingdom of God mm. is actually someone just living in God's power. That's action. That's an action word, not just an idea of like, oh, this sounds like fun to talk about right now, you know? Yeah. And just as you were saying, I wrote down those words that it looked like healing, it looked like miracles, and it looked like care. That in each of those words, another person has to be involved. Mm. Like love is not just a, a, a principle in a vacuum. Like it, it's when it's an action, it's building the kingdom of God. Everywhere in scripture, you ought to replace kingdom of God with people. Mm. That's what it is. 
right? When we talk about building the kingdom, re- it's not a building. The, yeah, it's not a building. It's not a farm. It is people. Those are analogies. Build people. Heal people. Be, you know, call down miracles for people. Care for people. Like that is what it looks like. Mm. And it's even cuter because right next in the verse 21, he's going to say to them, what do you want? What will ye? Should I come to unto you with a rod or in love? And I love that he wants to say, listen, love is actually action. Love is a verb. You got to start acting like it. And that is actually how you build the kingdom of God is through love. Mm-hmm. You can talk about building the kingdom of God all you want, but what it actually looks like to do it is to use action in love. Yeah. And I remember, I'm sure that my mom talked about this on here, but she probably has a different version of it than me because I don't know her study behind it or anything. But I walked into our house. It had to have been like a year ago. I don't remember exactly when. And my mom loves to do this, that she'll just write whatever she's thinking about on a sticky note and place it wherever she's living her life. Yeah. And I just walked up to the fridge one day and right center fridge was just this sticky note. The kingdom is yours till I come. And... When I read this verse, what I want to think is, if the kingdom's mine, then I better start coming in love. You know? Mm. That's what Paul wants me to do. He doesn't want me to talk about the kingdom. He doesn't want me to get up and just start sharing all my ideas. He's actually saying, I want you to start loving the kingdom. Just come in love. It's yours. Take it while you're here. Figure it out. And just start loving people because that's what it actually looks like to be a part of the kingdom. Yeah, and again, of kingdoms people, it's just back to that parable from Matthew 25, right, of mm. the talents Yeah, that um, we taught in Matthew 25 is the parable of the chickens, you know, that like Greg and his chickens, like take care, if he gave you his chickens, you'd be like, take care of these, please. Yeah. You, you would take care of them, you know, because like, I know they're important to you. When he's, the kingdom is yours, he's like, do these things in love. You actually, his other option is with a rod, you know, it's just <laughs> like, and, and that you could get a quick fix, you know, and may, and not to call you out, but you know, you maybe <laughs> learned that on your trip where you're oh. like, dude, don't throw rocks. And yeah. sometimes you have to like come in and like discipline and that's okay. Right. But like section 121 says, then follow up with love because love is actually what is going to work. And in reality... I could have continued to tell that boy what he was doing wrong that entire trip. Right. Or the spirit could have said, hey, actually, like, you have a chance to love. And let me show you what I can do when you love. Yeah. Yeah. That's so awesome. Um, If you, on the opening tip-in that you got um, in here, you'll see one of the problems that is happening in Corinth is this problem with immorality. There's division, which we're going to talk about next time a lot. Um, But then there's also, they have a problem with immorality. And chapter five and six are a lot about that. Um, And uh, chapter six in particular is talking about this idea that's out in the world of the Corinthians, that it doesn't really matter what you do with your body. And it doesn't really matter who you have um, intimate sexual relationships with. You know, that's an idea that you can see still permeating our world today. Right, where you're just like, listen, this this doesn't matter, and let me give you the reasons why, and let me be really eloquent and give you all this, you know, all this about it. Um, and it seems like that is just reheated leftovers today because they were dealing with it two thousand years ago in in Corinth. And he comes in and he talks to them about that, some of the things and the ideas that they are believing. Um, and there's something that I think is is really the approach that he takes with this is awesome. And I actually think this is a beautiful approach that the New for Strength of Youth pamphlet has done. Here's this quote we want to show you. It's printed in, your, in the journal also, but it's this famous Amish quote. And it says this, because someone might look at the Amish people and be like, it's, I'm so fascinated by the way that you live. And it's so cool that you do the things that you do. And you're so committed to that lifestyle. And there's this famous Amish quote where it says, does it ever occur to them outsiders, right? That we aren't what we are because of the way that we live. That's not, we, um, lifestyle or, or trying to approach a certain lifestyle. We didn't start that way. It says this, but rather we live as we do because of what we are. It comes from the inside out. And Paul does come in and say like, you guys, 
you cannot be living like this. Of course it matters. These are things of the soul. And quickly he gets into the inside out principle here. And for Paul, that inside out principle is, he says, you are the Lord's. And the way that you use your body and your mind and your thoughts are, are for his causes and his purposes. He helps them understand that inside out principle. And he says, um, and teaches them several things about that. He's like, don't you understand that like you make up the body of Christ? And so when you do something, you, you represent him. Uh, you're, you know, and he teaches them that inside out principle. But the favorite thing that he teaches them, my favorite thing that he teaches them is, is this. Verses 19 and 20 he says, Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and that you are not your own. He says, don't you remember that you're, you are the, the temple of God? Um, this to me is first he's teaching them one of their purposes. A temple's purpose, when you see a temple, um, you, you are awed by it. The, the beauty, your, your gaze goes to heaven. Immediately you begin to think the thoughts of God. Temples are places where you learn about him and where you connect with him in significant ways. And Paul is teaching them that. He said, Adam and Eve were given a commission to be an image bearer of God so that when people saw them, they thought of him. Mm -hmm. That people learned how to connect to God and they learned about who he was from them. And he tells them, be the temples of God. Let people see those stones and gold and precious, you know, silver, whatever those words were. And, and think, oh, I want a life like that. And, and I want a life with him. Let the way you are turn. He's like, that's your purpose. And then he tells them their identity in verse 20. He says, for you are bought with a price. Um, come back to the Savior paid a great price for you. Um, you were worth so much to him. If, if someone gave me or if I, you know, had a car that was like really, really expensive, like I, I don't let the kids like touch it or, you know, like I take <laughs> care of it differently. And he's just like, if you understood that about what he saw in you and what you were worth to him, you might live differently. That's that inside out principle that we learned from that quote and that Paul is using here. If I know what my purpose is and I know what my identity is, my actions start to be different. I'm not who I am because of my actions. I am who I am because of what I believe. And then the actions come second with that. And I think that would just be a great way to teach any kind of principle. Here it's immorality, sexual immorality, but that would be a great way to learn and teach any principle. Begin with like, wait, what, what, first of all, who's, who's are you? Understand how valuable you are in, in his eyes. And then also understand your purpose and then your actions start to reflect those two things. And it just makes me want to like think almost that if God could grab you by the shoulders in that moment, I think he would just want to look at you and just say, you were worth the price. Yeah. You know? And so many people don't believe that. And, you know, we grow and work together with God. It's so powerful that he's showing, we're seeing in here so many different ways that not only that he's building us, but a chance for us to build others as well. Mm -hmm. And what we need to understand and the way that we live in order for him to build us and for and then for us to build other people um, as well. But like it started at the very, very beginning and how it ends here, like that very beginning words were, let me remind you of who, Jesus is the, the king of all kings, creator of heaven and earth. And he was willing to set all of that aside for you. He thinks that you are worth every, every bit of that. And there's something about believing that and knowing that, you know, and, and, and that being planted in someone, you might mm. teach that in a lesson um, and remind people of it. And somewhere along the way, in Costa Rica or in a car ride or, or kneeling by a bedside, that increase and in, that will come alive. That truth will come alive in people and they'll be able to recognize it and believe it for themselves.
It's worth the wait. Yeah, it's worth the wait. Um, all right, y'all. We will see you for the part two. I think there's three parts to Corinthians. I was going to say the second half, but part Surprise. two of Corinthians next time. Bye.